Good morning. Uh, glad you could be with us this morning. My name is Ray Walker and I'm the director for the Medicare Assistance Program at the Oklahoma Insurance Department. And we're really happy that you're here for this next segment in our series uh, re related to Medicare open enrollment. And today we're going to be a little bit to the side of that because we're going to be talking about Social Security, which is another very important topic. So wanted to remind you before we get into the meat of our presentation, one, it's open enrollment. We're right in the middle of it right now. So it's a very good time for people to be making decisions about their Medicare and, and what changes they may want to make to make sure that they've got the best coverage for the coming year. So reminding you our phone number 1-800-763-2828 and talk to one of our counselors about, you know, are you on the right drug plan or if you're considering a Medicare Advantage plan or something like that. So please take advantage of this opportunity. You've only got to December 7th to make any of those changes. So please give us a call. Uh, also wanted to remind you, this is the, I believe, sixth of our webinars. And the webinars that we have done so far, if you miss those, or if you wanna go back and listen to them again, uh, you can actually go to the website, oid.ok.gov, and there's a banner at the top of the page that will scroll by and you'll see the banner where you registered for these events. You can go on there and listen to those past uh, webinars that we've already done. Those are those are kept up there and we'll keep them there for a while. So please, you know, take advantage of that opportunity and uh, uh, watch those videos, suggest them to other people, whatever works for you. So I uh, want to also tell you about next week, we've got something new that we're going to be doing. Uh, it's going to be our first webinar, uh, the Welcome to Medicare webinar in Spanish. So if you know somebody, if you work with an organization, if there's some entity out there that's helping the uh, Hispanic elders in our community that could benefit from this Welcome to Medicare webinar, please give them the information. Uh, point them to our website so that they can get registered. It will be next Wednesday, the 17th at 10 a.m. Carmen Irwin from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services will be presenting. And so the whole thing is gonna be in Spanish. Uh, our own Elia Insko from our team is gonna be emceeing because I don't speak Spanish and she does fluently. And so she's going to be kind of rolling, uh, running the show next week for us. So keep your fingers crossed for her. I know she's gonna do a great job. Uh, okay, so moving into today's webinar, I wanted to remind everybody these are recorded. So we are recording the webinar today as well. If you do have any questions, about uh, what Jose is gonna present on. There is a chat box down in the lower right corner of your screen. You won't be able to speak, we won't be able to hear you, but you can chat your questions in, in that box and I'll be monitoring that. And when Jose is done presenting, then we'll go back and we'll go through all of those questions, get the answers that you're looking for. So without further ado, let me introduce to you, Jose Olivero. He is the Public Affairs Specialist for the Social Security Administration in Oklahoma. Prior to that, he was the rate wage report specialist in Oklahoma and North Texas, as well as being the agency's liaison officer to the IRS. Uh, he's been with the agency since 2004. He has a degree from Cameron University in Lawton and a master's from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, he taught Spanish language and culture at the University of Oklahoma. He is also a retired Sergeant first class of the US Army Medical Corps with 21 years of active service. So Jose, Thank you so much for joining us. This is, I think, your second or third year uh, for doing that with us, and we really, really appreciate it. So go for it. Well, first of all, thank you, Ray, for giving me this opportunity to uh, uh, reach out to folks here in Oklahoma about Social Security. Uh, we are um, at this point. Uh, let's see if I can get started uh, for a second. All right, uh, I will start by uh, telling you a little bit about the operational status of Social Security offices across the nation uh, before I actually get into the issue of uh, benefits. Uh, as you know, uh, probably already know that uh, Social Security offices across the nation have been uh, closed to the public since uh, March of last year. Um, so uh, the only way that you can actually do business with us is through the internet by visiting our website www.socialsecurity.gov, or you can call our 800 number, 1-800-772-1213, uh, 
And at the end of this presentation, I also have the telephone numbers for the local offices, which you can also call uh, to either uh, set up appointments for retirement or disability uh, over the phone, or uh, they can direct you to or assist you uh, in filing for benefits online as well. So uh, at this point, we are not sure when uh, the offices are going to be open. We are hoping that that will be in the next uh, few months uh, because we understand how uh, people are used to doing business with us in that way, and, and we are going to do everything we can to accommodate uh, our customers. First of all, um, today about 180 million workers are uh, working and paying into Social Security uh, as of the end of last year, and that constitutes about 93% of all the workers in the United States, uh, that other seven, eight percent constitute folks who are either uh, self-employed or they are working at a location where they do not pay social security. Some uh, school districts and county offices have their own retirement system and, and so they don't pay into social security. Um, as of December, 2020, we had 46.9 million Retire workers receiving benefits from Social Security across the nation, and that constitutes about seven and a half, uh, excuse me, seventy one and a half billion dollars a month of Social Security benefits going out. At the same time, we had another three million dependents uh, of work, retired workers, spouses, and children receiving an additional two point four billion dollars uh, a month from Social Security benefits. This chart will show you that uh, currently. Uh, 811,000 people, a little more than that, uh, are receiving benefits from Social Security right here in Oklahoma as of the end of last year. And that's $1.1 billion a month of benefits coming to the state. So you can see how important Social Security is not just uh, to the individual, but as to the economy of Oklahoma as a whole, given that you know, this this money goes directly to paying bills and taking grandchildren to the movies or to ice cream, uh, paying for health care medications as well. Uh, what I'd like to point out to you is that out of that 111,000 Oklahomans, and, and keeping in mind that our population is about uh, 3.7 million people, so almost one out of every four Oklahomans are receiving benefits, uh, nearly 600,000 of them are people who are 65 or over and uh, statistics is showing us that nearly 80 percent of those folks all they have is social security as a source of income in their old age now from the beginning social security was set up to be the foundation of your retirement we were to provide somewhere between 25 and 40 percent of the average income that you receive throughout your working life um, so it was set up so you will also have uh, some pensions, uh, maybe 401k, some savings, investments, uh, some other income, perhaps from rental properties or uh, maybe some additional work after you retire. But what you can see here is basically what your retirement should look like. We were never set up to be everything uh, that you needed uh, when you retired. Now. The question is, how do I qualify for Social Security benefits? Well, very simple. You need 40 credits. What is a credit? Well, a credit, uh, and I'm using the numbers that are coming up for 2022, uh, since we're so close to the end of the year. Uh, what a credit is, is a three-month period of time in which you earn at least $1,510 uh, gross income during that three months. So you can get one credit for that period of time. You can attain up to four credits a year, which means that by the time that you're 62, in order to receive a minimum benefit of Social Security, you need to have at least 10 years of work under the Social Security system. Now, they don't have to be consecutive, but once again, you need to have at least 10 years of work under the system to be able to receive a benefit from Social Security, and may I add also for Medicare. Now, the way we determine how much we're going to pay you is by looking at your earnings statement. Perhaps some of you recall that we used to send you a letter 
each year telling you how much money you have paid into Social Security. And that is your earning statements. And I'm going to show you here in a few minutes uh, the latest edition of that. Um, but anyway, uh, so that shows how much you pay into Social Security and Medicare and your employer over your entire working lifetime. The first thing we're going to do, we're going to take all that money and bring it to today's value. In other words, we're going to adjust it for inflation. Then we are going to talk, take the top 35 years of earnings and we're going to average that out by year and by month. That will give you give us a number that we're going to plug into the formula to determine how much you actually are going to get. So let's say, for instance, that you work 40 years under the Social Security system. Okay, so we bring that money to today's value. We take the top 35 years. We disregard the bottom five, and that gives us a fairly, fairly good number to plug into your formula. However, let's say you only work for 20 years. The law requires that we use 35 years, which means you are going to have 15 zeros in that computation, and thereby your average index monthly earnings is going to be a lot lower. So, in other words, the longer you work, the more you pay, the higher the benefit you will receive from Social Security. The next question many people ask is, when should I receive my benefit? When can I, should I retire? And of course, we cannot tell you that for sure because uh, we don't know what your financial situation is and, and healthcare wise and that sort of thing. But we did uh, come up with uh, this chart, which basically um, kind of give you a prospect of what social security would be uh, from 62 up to the age of 70. And the reason 62 is because that's the earliest time that you can get benefits, retirement benefits, and 70 is the uh, highest uh, amount of years in which we will uh, possibly give you some additional money, uh, some additional credits if you decide to wait until you retire then. So let's say uh, you are uh, going to retire at your full retirement age. And for the purpose of this presentation, we are using the example of the age of 62. What is the full retirement age? Well, the full retirement age is a date set by Congress based on your year of birth that this, the, um, says that once you achieve that age, we will consider you fully retired, whether you are working or not. So your full retirement age is a time in which we consider you fully retired, whether you're working or not, which means you can get your benefits from Social Security and continue to work and earn as much money as you want. And it will have no effect on the benefit that you get from Social Security. However, if you retire before your full retirement age, you're going to take a reduction in benefits, a permanent reduction, because, of course, you're going to be uh, receiving benefits for a, long, a longer period of time. Now, if you decide to wait past your full retirement age before you apply for the benefit, you can wait up to the age of 70, and we will give you additional credits. And as you can see in this chart, uh, let's say the person's full retirement age is in the center at age 66, and he's scheduled to receive $1,000. If that person was to retire at 62, they will have a permanent reduction and will receive only $750 a month for the rest of their lives. However, if this same person decides to wait until the age of 70, you can see 1320 will be the amount that they will get. Um, now, this is an example, and we will certainly uh, compute your benefit based on the actual age and month that you decide to retire. So it's a sliding scale and it will uh, change based on when you decide to retire by month. Now, what this chart shows you is uh, what your full retirement age is based on the year that you were born. For example, people who were born in 1957 in the middle of the chart their full retirement age is not 66, but 66 years and six months. If that person decides to retire at 62 rather than waiting for his full retirement age, they would lose 27 and a half percent of the money that they will normally get at full retirement age. Not only that, benefits that could be payable to a spouse under your Social Security would also be reduced by 32 and a half percent 
of the already reduced amount of 27.5 that you have. So basically what we are saying is that um, you need to ensure that as you prepare to retire, you take these numbers in consideration because that's a lot of money that you would lose over the uh, over your lifetime and your benefits to your surviving spouse and children could also be um, have a negative uh, effect on, on uh, the, the monies they get. Now, the best way and the easiest way to determine how much money you can get and uh, where your status is in Social Security is by applying for a My Social Security account. My Social Security accounts can be found in our uh, website, www.socialsecurity.gov. Uh, and by uh, accessing this, you will be able to access at least 11 online calculators that would help you determine how much you can get per year uh, based on whatever early or late retirement, how much benefits can be paid to your spouse. There's an estimator to show you uh, at least three or four, uh, excuse me, three uh, what if scenarios that you can calculate and determine uh, different things. The earnings test, which is, uh, We'll talk about here in a little bit about how much money you can still earn uh, from work and receive social security benefits before your full retirement age. Um, we, this is hot off the press. This is what our new uh, statement looks like and it's tailored to each individual. Uh, so you access my social security and you'll be able to see this. You'll be able to print it. And as you're looking at, at in the uh, left side page, uh, it's, it's personalized, so it will show you exactly how much you can get today, uh, and it will go through all the years up to the age of 70. On the right side, it would also show you um, how much you have paid into Social Security over the years uh, with how much your, your Social Security taxes you paid and your employer paid, as well as Medicare. And it also has some links to show you um, additional information based on your age group. So, for instance, if you access it and you're between 49 and 60, this will be the link that will show you and will explain to you uh, your benefits about retirement and uh, how uh, this works and uh, things about your family and, and spouses and so on. So, this is a, a something that we just came up with uh, uh, about a month ago. So, I encourage you to, as soon as possible, open a My Social Security account uh, that you can see this if you have not retired yet. And of course, if you have already retired, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do uh, online uh, to include getting your benefit statements and uh, tax statements and that sort of thing for Social Security. So the question is, if I decide to retire, can I still do some work and retain my benefits? As I mentioned before, once you achieve your full retirement age, there is no limit. You can go to work, make as much money as you want to, and we will not be concerned with that. However, if you start work uh, retirement benefits at age 62, the current limit for 2022 will be $19,560 a year, approximately $1,630 a month. If you go and earn more than that, and this is gross income, we will offset your check. In other words, we're gonna take back $1 for every $2 that you go over the 19,560. Now that limit um, applies from the age of 62 up to January the 1st of the year that you turn full retirement age. From January the 1st of the year that you turn full retirement age until the first of the month that you turn full retirement age, regardless, regardless of what date uh, is your birthday during the month, we will make it effective the first of the month. The limit goes up to 51960 and if you make more than that, of course, then we're going to take back uh, $1 for every $3 that you make. And once you get to the first day of the month that you turn full retirement age, uh, once again, there's no limit. Now, that is applying to Social Security. Uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is that taxation of Social Security benefits. Uh, now, taxation is not a Social Security business. This is the IRS business. But um, we feel strongly that uh, all our people should know about this because you don't want to be uh, surprised by a tax bill from the IRS thinking that you didn't uh, 
have to pay social uh, taxes on your social security benefits. Now, the way this works is um, based on your 1040. Uh, from, and, and the IRS is the one who's going to make the determination whether you have to pay taxes or not. So let's say you and your spouse are filing a combined benefit uh, income tax. If you combine income is less than $32,000, then you have no liability um, in your social security benefits. However, if your combined uh, income is between 32 and 44,000, up to half of your social security is taxed. And if you make more than 44,000, up to 85% of your social security is taxable. So it's important that as you prepare for retirement, you are also aware of this. Now, when you apply for social security retirement, we will not automatically take any, any taxes from your check. You'll have to uh, let us know that you want that done. Uh, there is an IRS form that we'll be happy to print uh, and send it to you. You can sign it and send it back to us. We will send it to the treasury for them to go ahead and take the appropriate action. We can only take uh, the treasury, we can only take federal taxes, no state taxes. So that will be another issue that you may want to think about as you prepare to retire. Now, uh, the other issue that we are involved in is Medicare. Now, please understand that our uh, connection to Medicare is enrollment and enrollment only. What they pay, issues that you may have with your doctors or your prescription plan, there is absolutely nothing that we can do about these things. So, uh, and the reason is that when Medicare uh, first started in 1965, we were one United Agency and we needed to find out, you know, who are the people over 65, where, where are they and how can we collect the premiums? And that's how Social Security got into this deal. Now, uh, currently we have uh, what we call Part A of Medicare, the original, Medicare, which is your hospital insurance, uh, and it helps to pay some of the costs uh, when you're hospitalized. Part B of Medicare, which is your medical insurance, uh, right now is 140, uh, was it 148.50, and we expect that to go up uh, $10 next year. We're not sure where that is going to go yet. And Part B of Medicare helps to pay some of the costs when you visit your doctor, um, and that sort of thing. You, uh, x-rays, lab, and that sort of thing. Uh, they don't pay all, but that's uh, the, uh, they pay a percentage of that. Then there are prescription plans, uh, Part D Medicare, and um, currently uh, for 2022, there will have 23 plans. As I understand it, starting between 650 uh, a month, uh, 670 a month, and not $5 a month, depending on you know what you want, what you're taking, and how often you take your medications. Uh, so it's important that um, uh, you understand that if you have any further questions, so of course, you can talk uh, to the Oklahoma Insurance Department, or you can go to the Medicare um, website to further information. Uh, we don't know anything about this uh, sort of thing at Medicare. We simply do enrollment. Now, speaking of enrollment, when are you eligible for Medicare? Well, age 65, uh, and that's across the nation, except if you have ALS, uh, kidney failure, or uh, you become disabled, there's some exceptions to those rules. But generally speaking, to the average pair, age 65 is when you need to start uh, be, uh, you're eligible for Medicare, uh, A, B, and D. Now, the way this works is, as far as Social Security, is that you have an initial enrollment period that covers a seven-month window around your 65th birthday, three months before, three months after, and your month of birth. This is the time that you need to sign up for Medicare Part A and B. Uh, <clears throat> however, the exception is if you are already receiving a Social Security check prior to that date, we will automatically enroll you in Medicare A, Medicare B, and we will send you some information about the prescription plan for you to decide whether you want them or not. So this is the important thing to remember. As you turn 65, you have, and, and if you don't have a social security benefit coming in yet, you need to know this is the time to contact social security, go to our website or go to Medicare and get informed about this deal. Now, 
if you fail to sign up for Medicare during your initial enrollment period, you will have to wait until next year for a general enrollment period. That is normally between January and March every year, but the healthcare coverage do not begin until July. So it's important, once again, you don't, you don't miss those dates. There is an exception to that, however, if you are working and covered through group health insurance, or maybe you are not working, but you are covered through your spouse, group health insurance, who is working, then we'll give you what's called a special enrollment period. This special enrollment period would allow you to sign up for Medicare Part B down the road whenever you are wanting to start it. Uh, and within a seven month window, uh, correction, I think it's eight month window, and correct me, Ray, if I'm wrong, um, where you can sign up when you're about to lose that group health coverage as well. Uh, understand that there will be a, uh, also, if you fail to uh, enroll during the initial enrollment period, there will be a 10% addition to your monthly fee uh, for your social, for your Medicare. So for every 12 months that you delay signing up for Medicare, uh, you will have that 10% that, that additional fee to pay uh, for your Medicare Part B and D. E. Uh, D, I think it's 12%. Yeah, 12% for D. 10% for A. Um, so this chart uh, just basically it tells you that if you uh, enroll in Medicare uh, three months before your month of birth, uh, then it will take effect on the first day of the month that you turn 65. If you wait into the month that you're 65, uh, it will kick in the next month. If you wait a month later, there's a two month delay on that. And if you wait two to three months, after your 65th birthday, there's an additional three month um, delay before you can, uh, before it kicks in. Uh, and, and the lesson to be taken from this is, you know, don't wait. If you know you're turning 65, you're not gonna get a call from anybody. You're not gonna be sending you any letters. You need to know you, if you're not receiving a check uh, that you need to contact uh, Medicare, you need to contact us uh, to apply for your Medicare at that point, if you're not receiving a check. Uh, uh, today, uh, uh, so at the end of December uh, 2021, we also pay benefits uh, to disabled Americans. We have 3.1 million uh, uh, dependents receiving benefits from Social Security. Uh, we also have um, the, uh, another 1.6 million dependents of disabled workers plus the disabled workers and retired workers. So we do pay a lot of money to uh, families. Um, and so the first person that we will think about is, you know, our spouses. So this is what the spouse benefits would look like. If you wait to retire at full retirement age and you get your 100% benefit, if your spouse waits until his or her full retirement age, she will be entitled to a combined benefit no greater than 50% of the amount received by the person that makes the most money. If you or your spouse retire before full retirement age, there were always going to be reductions on the amount of the benefit that you can get. So it's essential that once again, uh, using my social security website, you can go in there and look at those numbers and make a determination of what that would be like. Now, so what does that mean, 50% of the benefit? Uh, this also apply, before I go on to the actual numbers, uh, to divorced spouses. So if you were married to someone for at least 10 consecutive years, you are unmarried, and at least age 62, you may also be able to receive benefits on the, the social security number of your ex-spouse, regardless uh, of whether that person is receiving benefits or not. So this rule uh, applies to both currently married people and former spouses. So let's take an example of, uh, let's say I am 66 years old and this is my full retirement age according to the chart. 
and I'm going to get $1,000 from Social Security. What that means is that my person spouse and any former spouses that are still single and were married to me for at least 10 years are entitled to up to 50% of what I'm making as a combined benefit. What does that mean? Well, anyone that applies for benefits must always apply for their own benefit first. So let's say an example that I'm currently married and I have two former spouses. And we'll say that all three ladies are um, full retirement age and uh, are, uh, the two former spouses are not remarried, single. So Social Security will take an application, let's say for the first spouse. Let's say we were married for 10 years, she's 66, she applies. She has to apply for her own. Uh, and technically speaking, as I mentioned before, because of my $1,000, she's entitled to up to $500 under my Social Security as a combined benefit. She applies and it turns out that she is entitled to $300 under her own Social Security. By law, we have to pay that first. So she will receive her $300 and then Social Security will add $200 from my account. So she will get to that combined $500. Let's say my second spouse uh, did a lot better. She applied for the benefits and it turned out that she's entitled to $700 on her own. Well, $700 is far greater than the $500 combined benefit, which means she will get, continue to get her $700 and will not be entitled to any benefits under my social security. Let's look at my person's spouse. Well, she stay home raising children and, uh, never work work outside the home. She goes and applies. She has no benefits coming on her own. Therefore, she will be entitled to the entire $500 per month, which means at the end of the day, I will continue to get my $1,000 because no matter how many people collect under my social security, my thousand would always be my thousand and that will never change. Um, so I get my thousand, my present spouse will get 500. My second spouse will get no benefit and my first spouse will get $200 for Social Security, and of course, we will live happily ever after. Uh, children can also receive benefits on their Social Security once I retire. They have to be unmarried, uh, younger than the age of 18. Now, there's an exception for kids between 18 and 19 who are still attending full-time high school and unmarried. If those children are still going to school, we will pay up to the age of 19 or whenever they graduate from high school, whichever one is first. Now there's another additional um, exception is for children, your own children that are um, older than uh, 18. We can pay for disabled children, adult children, the conditions to that is that your disabled child must have been disabled before the age of 22. In other words, before the 22nd birthday. If that is the case, we will continue to pay disabled adult benefits to this child under your social security benefits as long as they are disabled. So it's important that if you have a child with disabilities that uh, once you turn in your application for social security, this is one of the questions we will ask um, that you give us that information so we can start making a disability determination on that child. Uh, so virus benefits are basically the same for children. <clears throat> However, the change comes on the widows and widowers. My widow, if I pass away today, can actually we, uh, apply for benefits on their social security under my number as early as the age of 60. And at that time, she can receive up to 71 and a half percent of what I was scheduled to receive at my full retirement age. She can also apply for disability benefits under my social security between the age of 50 and 60. That survivor's benefit, like I mentioned, will be 71.5% started in 60. And if she decides to wait until her full retirement age, she can receive up to 100% of the benefit that I was going to get, regardless of her own numbers. 
which means that if you are a surviving spouse, you can start uh, receiving benefits at 60. And down the road, if there is an uh, occasion where you will be receiving more benefits under your own Social Security, we will certainly let you know because the system makes a yearly recalculation of benefits uh, in December to ensure that uh, you're getting the highest possible amount of money. And if it shows that you can get it $1 higher or more on the, the other account, we will send you a letter concerning that. Um, and, and one more thing on this deal is that uh, you have to be single, but once you apply for the benefit of 60 and start receiving that benefit, you are um, allowed to remarry and it will not change your status. So you can continue to receive the survivor's benefits uh, even though you are married to someone else past the age of 60. Uh, Remember that if you do go to work, that will have a negative effect on the amount of benefits that you can get because the earnings limits still will apply. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. All the benefits that we can pay uh, if you are providing at least one half of the support uh, for your uh, parents and you pass away, we will consider them your dependents and we can pay them on that. And we have a long sum death payment. A surviving spouse and child uh, or child can receive this one time benefit payment of $255. Uh, but it must again minor children or surviving spouse only. Uh, in this, uh, chart here, I have uh, placed the spouse living benefits versus the death benefits side by side to kind of uh, let you see uh, the difference. And uh, if you contact um, the insurance department uh, after this um, webinar, you can uh, receive a copy of this presentation as well uh, for your records. So we come into uh, a couple of things concerning uh, Social Security. Uh, recently, we received the uh, report from the Treasury as to the situation, uh, financial status of Social Security. We currently have uh, almost three trillion dollars in the trust fund. The trust fund is um, where the um, uh, Taxes that are received, Social Security taxes, are placed uh, in whole until they're used. And as you know, Social Security set up it was set up a system where people who are working today are paying today, and with this money we pay the retirees. Now, uh, like I said, we almost have uh, three trillion dollars on, on account, which means we have plenty of money to pay benefits. Uh, to retirees and disabled people and their families um, at this point. However, the uh, latest estimate is that that trust fund will be exhausted by 2035. Uh, the reason being that we have in the past few years due to the pandemic and financial crisis that occurred in 2008, we had had a lot of people who were planning to work longer that instead uh, of paying into Social Security, decided to or had to retire and start receiving Social Security benefits. So at this point, we are paying more in um, benefits than we're receiving in taxes. So we are using some of this money that is in the trust fund to pay uh, the beneficiaries today. Now, that money will continue to diminish, and it looks like by the year 2035 that trust fund will be completely gone. And thereby, we're only gonna be able to pay you 75, 79 to 80% of the money that you were promised. So if you were to receive that $1,000 check in 2035, that will drop down to $800. Now, um, is there anything Social Security can do about this? No. At Social Security, we are the administrators of the system. It takes uh, the legislature, the federal Congress, um, to come up with solutions on how to fix or make the social security system sustainable. Now, uh, we have faced a uh, similar situation about 14 times in the last 82 years. So what that tells you is that 
uh, at, at every single time Congress have been able to come up with some solutions to modify the system to avoid uh, cutting benefits from individuals. Today, we haven't seen anything just yet uh, on this. Uh, so it's up to you as a uh, beneficiary or future beneficiary to contact your elected officials. And I'm not saying this from a uh, political standpoint, simply that uh, anyone that is elected in Congress uh, from your district is supposed to represent all of us, uh, regardless of parties or ideology. So I encourage uh, you to uh, take the time to contact your elected officials and make them aware of how important this is to you and for your family and ask some questions as to you know what are they planning to do uh, because they have to work together to ensure that this program, uh, like I said, uh, Oklahoma received $1.1 billion a month uh, from, from just social security benefits and the large number of people in our, in our state who depend on this money um, to live. And, and it's, you know, most people will tell you, you know, you can't live on social security. Imagine if they uh, were to lose 20 or 21% of uh, their benefit. The other thing that we, uh, I'd like to address is, you know, ID theft and uh, telephone scams and internet scams that we have seen. Um, really increase over the last couple of years. Um, Social Security get about 35,000 calls a month of people telling us, you know, that they were scammed, that their ID was taken somehow, that uh, they had all kinds of issues. And, and the bottom line is that Social Security uh, cannot really do anything about this. Uh, once you give somebody your ID, and your social security, I don't care under what circumstances, uh, it's a crime and we're not into law enforcement. Uh, what we can do is uh, switch maybe your bank account if you open a different account, uh, but we cannot issue new social security numbers. Uh, that, that, you know, we, we just can't do any of that. Uh, and many people are calling us panicky after uh, they have made this deal. So once again, this is a crime and you need to report it to local uh, law enforcement. And then you need to take some actions about securing your identity. Now, the Federal Trade Commission uh, have come up with this new website uh, this year. It's called identitytheft.gov, identitytheft.gov. You can go here and um, they will help you uh, to get a recovery plan started. Uh, for those of you who have uh, been uh, victims of ID theft, what they do, they will uh, help you to personalize uh, the program just for you. They have the affidavits and uh, you can review and update documents. You, you, it has a customized pre-fill letters to send to the credit bureaus and businesses and debt collection agencies. Uh, that might be looking uh, to get some money from you because of what happened. Um, and they will give you updates to help you stay on track. And of course, they have all kind of advice and, and things that you can do uh, when you're affected by specific data breaches from uh, your bank or your credit union or, or some other business that you're in. So this is a fantastic uh, site. Once again, www.identitytheft.gov. And they can, you know, it's a, it's a great place, a great resource for those who have been affected. Now, uh, this is what our uh, social security webpage looks like. And uh, as you can see, it has these big tiles where you can put, um, you can go and click in for retirement, disability, and here in the bottom left corner, uh, it, this is where you can access my social security account where you can uh, go in there and look at your records and uh, try to make a determination of when it's best to retire. Uh, this um, tile here shows you the local numbers of our social security offices. And uh, uh, this is once again, the first resource is our national number. And my email is below that in case you have some questions down the road and you'd like to address them. I'll be more than happy to, to uh, see um, 
what we can do to help you um, in terms of uh, getting connected to the right people. So at this point, um, I send it back to you, Ray, uh, for any questions that we may have. All right, thanks, Jose. That was a lot of really good information. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, you had mentioned about the penalty that's for Part B. If you are late in enrolling in Part B, and that that is ten percent of the monthly premium that gets tacked on to their Part B uh, premium payments, and that's paid from now on. That's not a one-time penalty. And then the same thing is true. For the Part D plans, the prescription drug plans, there's another penalty. It's a little bit different. It's 1% of the base beneficiary premium, but that too gets tacked onto the monthly premium and they continue to pay that. Now, the question is, those the, the penalty, whether it's for Part B or Part D, that gets paid to Social Security. Do you have any idea what that penalty money is used for or where it goes? Um. First of all, it's not paid to Social Security. The Treasury take it and send it to Medicare because this is part of the Medicare fee. And it plays like any other insurance company. Let's say you apply for um, uh, uh, long-term care when you are 40. You're going to have this amount of fee. If you wait until you're 60, they're going to charge you a lot more because you're a much bigger liability. And that is the purpose of this. Uh, so. Uh, the money that Medicare gets from this is uh, to pay for, for the health care. Okay. Just like the other fee. Next question. A lot of people are, uh, they've got another individual, uh, uh, one of their adult children or something like that, who's helping them manage their stuff. And that would probably include their business with Social Security. Is there something that those individuals need to do ahead of time so that they can interact on behalf of their loved one with Social Security? Well, I'm glad that you mentioned this because we started this uh, last year where you can call the local office and they can send you a, a, they'll take your information and they will send you a form for you to sign where you can designate uh, up to three different individuals who would be your selection for uh, in case you become disabled, unable to speak and take care of your business, we will contact these three individuals to select one of them to be responsible for taking care of your business. Um, so that that's that's a great uh, uh, plan or program that we started. So you are more in control uh, of your life and, and, and your benefits. Okay. Uh, also, there's a lot of the folks that we talked to. Uh, I've talked to a few of them this year. Older seniors who they're not using computers. The good news is. Social Security isn't doing away with their other access in terms of through the mail, through the office and stuff. Socialsecurity.gov is just another opportunity. Setting up that My Social Security account just gives you an, an easier access to the Social Security system. Otherwise, if someone doesn't have an email, they don't want to use a computer, whatever, that's okay. They'll still have what they've had in terms of access to Social Security in the past, correct? Right, you can call us 1-800-772-1213. Uh, you can call the local office um, and, and let us know, uh, you know, what you want. Uh, you can write us a letter and we still read. <laughs> so that's, that's uh, and like I said, we hope that um, early next year, we might be able to open the offices again to the public, uh, you know, so, we, so you can come in person. I'm, I'm not sure how that's gonna work out, uh, but we're well on track to try to get that done. Okay, another question that came in. When a child loses a parent, will the other parent have to apply for survivor benefits or is this automatically applied? Uh, yeah, the, the surviving parents have to apply for the benefit. Uh, we don't keep track of people, so we don't know if you're married, you're, you're not, if you have children or not. Uh, and, and, and as you know, in our society today, uh, I thought, saw it in, uh, recently something like uh, 40, Eight, forty-nine percent of children are born out of wedlock, so there's no way for us to know. Uh, so the the parent, uh, the surviving parent, need to contact Social Security and set up an appointment to to get that done. We okay. you cannot do that online. You have to do it um, uh, physically with someone in the phone. 
Okay. And a related question, will each child get the same amount of benefits? Uh, actually it does. So we have what is called a family max. That's the maximum we can pay the family of a surviving person. So let's say that um, you have, uh, what, let's say $1,500, $1,500, and you have um, three kids. So each one of them gets $500. When the older child turn 18, which is no longer available, uh, eligible for benefits, the other kid would then receive $750 apiece. Uh, we split the money, and when the second child age out, uh, the younger child will get the $1,500 until he or she turns 15, uh, 18. So, uh, yeah, we we'll, we'll spread it evenly uh, throughout. Okay, good. Okay, that was the last of our questions. Thank you very much, Jose. That was really good. Actually, I think something may have just popped in. Let's see this. It's kind of long. I'm just going to read it. Um, I think what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to get that question and I'm going to take it because it sounds like it could be uh, pretty specific to an individual. Okay. And I'll get that to you, Jose, and we'll get back to them with an answer. Okay. So, I'm, I'm, I'll be awake until 2.30, so... <laughs> Okay, I, I promise you that I will return uh, your, uh, I have a couple of things to do, but you will get an answer today. Okay, great. Uh, so we will we'll definitely get an answer to that one. Wanted to thank everybody for participating today and joining us. Uh, again, if you heard something and you think somebody could benefit from this information, point them to our website. Uh, in the next few days, this recording will be available there. And they'll be able to watch it and get the information as Jose offered. He, he's going to send that presentation to us. If you'd like a copy of the presentation, we would be happy to get that out to you. Uh, just send us an email and we can uh, get that to you as quickly as possible. And then also, one last reminder, next week is our presentation in Spanish. Welcome to Medicare. So if you know someone that could benefit from that as well, have them go to the website, oid.ok.gov. Get registered for the webinar. And then lastly, open enrollment period. Now's the time to review your Part D prescription drug coverage or whatever your health co coverage is. It's, it's a good opportunity for you to have a conversation with someone about what is covering your health care costs and are there any changes that you need to make or are you good to go? You, can you leave everything alone and go fishing? So uh, please give us a call. Let us know if there's anything we can do for you. Thanks everybody for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.